Welcome back to Advice from Your Advocates. I'm Bob Manner. I'm a certified elder law attorney in Michigan. And today we've got a special treat for you. Every year, Manor Law Group hosts a conference where we do training for those in the long-term care industry. We call it the Elder Advocacy and Law Boot Camp. And this year, we had a particularly interesting speaker as our keynote speaker that got rave reviews from the attendees at our boot camp, and we thought we would share it with you. So today, you're going to hear from Reverend Joe Krupp in uh, a conversation about finding joy in caregiving. We decided to invite uh, Reverend Joe Krupp to speak today, even though he was the chaplain for the Michigan State football team. So I, uh, I, I really had to second guess it a few times, but uh, no. <laughs> so uh, Joe has developed quite a following over the years, and it's strictly from his um, magnetic personality and attitude. It's something that I think you'll see. Um, he's a great speaker to have right after lunch. I think he'll keep us awake. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's just really a very... Uh, thought-provoking man. And that is uh, something. So when my father um, was in his last couple of years, he had been a very devout um, man going to church and just did not feel comfortable. And so he was able to watch, uh, I think that Joe's been doing uh, online um, information, online uh, presentations longer than uh, COVID. Uh, you know, they were well suited because they were up and running. And I know you got a great staff up and running within days after uh, after the shutdown to make sure that uh, he was able to get out to families. And I remember he would uh, walk through the streets, prayed through the streets of Grand Blank, which was amazing because people couldn't get to church, but they would come out to their um, driveways. And uh, they'd have, you know, receive a blessing from Father Joe. Father was, uh, you know, just uh, parading through the neighborhoods and picking the neighborhood. And uh, then his online presence, I think, grew tremendously during COVID, where people just uh, really from all over the place started watching. And it kind of tells you the story. When my dad, um, <clears throat> when we encouraged him to, to start watching Father Joe, um, and my dad was kind of a man of few words, but he was saying, He's he's a he's a very um, deep thinker, <laughs> and I thought, you know, uh, of all the things that they would describe Father Joe, I'm not sure too many people use that term. They usually say he's funny, he's entertaining, he's all those things. But when it really comes down to it, it is there's a lot of deepness to what he has to say, and uh, so even though he seems to like Michigan State for some reason, uh, we're gonna have Father Joe come up, and uh, I think you're gonna find this to be very helpful and uh, educational and entertaining. One, two, three. Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. When Bob came over and I found out it was a Wolverine, I had to show him our uh, my five Big Ten championship rings because I knew he hadn't seen one of those. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> uh, so as you heard, Joe Krupp, I, I work right near here now at uh, Holy Family in Grand Blank and St. Mark in Goodrich. And uh, uh, like he said, about two months before we went into quarantine, uh, we had been setting up a way uh, for all of our people who are in nursing homes uh, to be able to pray with us. So we had a volunteer for every nursing home. And I counted, there's 8 million uh, in Grand Blank alone. Um, and we got an iPad for each and we had someone assigned. So on Sunday, go to the nursing home, dial into the uh, mass and uh, we can all be together. And that's what we were set up for. And then the quarantine hit. And I started getting um, panicked messages uh, from people uh, who weren't even associated with the church that just, they were alone and they had plugged into the fear and anger machine and uh, things weren't going well. Uh, 
And so I said, we just, I literally started walking through the streets, had a sign. I'll, I'll talk to anybody. <laughs> and uh, um, it, it worked. It was really uh, an amazing couple years of just door to door, uh, even uh, step ladders. I, I, I took a step ladder with me for people on the second floor, uh, had a bullhorn. Uh, in fact, right when I was driving here, I, I came up by a circuitous route because I wanted to get my head together. And uh, I passed a house where um, one, this guy, he said, my wife has dementia. It's awful. We've been here a year and four months and no one's come. No one's, I said, I'm on my way. Right. Oh, and it was his, it was his wife's birthday. So uh, I called a ton of people and I said, we're going to meet at this address and we're going to sing happy birthday. And so I brought a bullhorn and um, we went in his yard and uh, just started singing happy birthday. And he carried, he was 70 years old. He carried his bride to the door. She couldn't walk anymore. And uh, there's just a million of those kind of things of, you know, keep the distance or whatever, but okay. Six feet, then, then six feet, not six feet, one inch, right? Six feet. Uh, and uh, yeah, God's good. Anyway. So um, I grew up on the other side of Flint over here, Beecher, Montrose, depending on what year it was. And and uh, my, I'm the youngest of uh, an obscene amount of children. Uh, we were a voting block. You're welcome. Uh, and uh, I decided early on I was going to go into uh, acting and television. And uh, after I graduated from college, I worked for Fox. The um, Fox, uh, what do you call it? It was Channel 66 back then here in Flint. Uh, they had, were just starting. And I was a script writer for sitcoms, and I did that for about a year. And then uh, after a year, I, I quite literally just abandoned everything and went into seminary. Uh, and it takes a while to make a priest, uh, but uh, I was ordained a priest, Catholic priest, uh, what, June of 98. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. Part of that, I served at MSU where Jesus went to school. Um, it's in the Bible. Don't look it up. Uh, but uh, worked there with Coach D'Antonio, um, who is uh, just an incredible human being. And, uh, uh, and then I guest lectured in their history department. I've got a uh, bunch of degrees in history and all kinds of and philosophy. So I plugged those in uh, wherever I could. Um, what I want to tell you uh, is some things I've learned uh, and, and my story on this topic of Alzheimer's and dementia started in 2012. Uh, so we're going to talk for a second about my mom, right? Uh, she was born in 1936 the youngest of 14 kids. Uh, and this is why I'm celibate. God's trying to chill out the gene pool. You know what I mean? It's like easy, you know. Uh, but um, <laughs> I always tell people, you know, when they're like, why don't priests get rid of them? Look at this face. Do you want more of it? Really? I mean, let's, but, oh, I don't need that mic, do I? I'm not bright. Uh, but uh, she was born 1936 on a farm in Maple Grove. Does anyone know Maple Grove? No? Yes, my lady. Uh, it's a uh, city. So there were 14 of them. That was Maple Grove. Uh, and um, she was, her, her dad, my grandpa said she was different from day one. Um, freakishly smart. Uh, and back then such a thing wasn't too common. She went to college, uh, and she really went after it. And what I knew, and I didn't figure it out because I knew everything for most of my life. Uh, but then this part started where I'm like, other people know things too. This is so weird. Uh, but when I was about 17, um, my mom was going over to Rome uh, with my dad and she was giving a talk. And when she got back, there was this picture of her and it was from the back and in front of her are about 40 Cardinals of the Roman church and Pope John Paul II. And she had one finger up and I could tell by that body position, somebody was getting their, uh, get, yeah. Uh, we always said getting their back orange painted red. Uh, but, uh, and I looked at the faces of these you know, important-ish people. And I was like, 
that's my mom, right? And, and I started to pay more attention. And I, I, I knew this from when I was a kid, but I thought all moms did this. So you, you know your mom, right? She would sit every night with a book on each leg and a highlighter in each hand. And she'd read two books and she would highlight them. And you could say to her 10 years later, such and such book, page 15, she'd tell you. Um, she just had a scary, scary brain. It was really cool. Um, North Flint really collapsed, right, when I was a boy. And what I knew is about once a month, our priest, his car would pull up, and there would be kids in that car. And dad would go out and talk to father on the table, and kids would move in our house, right? And this, now we weren't rich, but we had a farm, so we always had food, yeah? And um, in the end, we counted 38 kids uh, that my mom and dad took in in about a 20-year period of their life, besides the 12 they already had. Uh, we were packed in that house, um, but they just kept doing it. When kids from Mexico moved in, mom learned Spanish, because who wouldn't, right? When kids from Brazil she had took in three kids from Brazil when she was 70. She learned Portuguese, right? God can't speak Portuguese, all right? Uh, she learned this at 70. This was who she is. And um, I remember something going haywire when she called me. We had a conversation. We hung up the phone, and she called immediately, and we had the same conversation. And at first, I thought she was hilarious. I thought, oh, she's screwing with me, you know. And uh, I just, I don't know, moved on. And then sisters and brothers all started talking, and we were realizing something's going really wrong with mom. And uh, so we went to the doctor, and he said, she, she has uh, dementia, and it's going to get really bad. And it did. But when she found this out, she said, I'm asking two things. I want all my kids in one place. Can we do it? And I want it before I lose my ability to enjoy it. Uh, two, I want to die at home. Will you promise me I'll die at home? And so we agreed. Uh, now, all of us had never been in the same location before. Never happened. I've got family that moved, uh, I've got a brother who converted to Islam and he lives in uh, Qatar, which is far away. Uh, and by the way, no bacon. We were like, what? <laughs> but uh, anyway, <laughs> we got family everywhere. And so we just started writing. We picked a date at the end of June of 2012 and we pulled it off, yeah? Uh, 38 kids, their spouses, and their kids. Uh, and we threw down for two days, right? We just partied like it was 1999, yeah? And uh, to quote St. Prince uh, of the third century, uh, we <laughs> it was the coolest and worst two days ever, yeah? Um, and... I just, I was so grateful for that. And the slide was hard and fast. Uh, I, uh, we took her to a neuropsychologist who said, I've not seen it move this fast. And my dad went, her brain goes fast. That's, <laughs> but um, so that's what we did. Now, in terms of how many kids live in Michigan, ugh, I can't do this. Back then, there were eight of us uh, that lived within well, there were eight of my siblings that lived within a half hour of mom and dad. I was assigned, uh, you know, when you're a priest, they, they move you, right? So I was assigned two hours and 15 minutes away. And, uh, you know, this became one of the hardest fights as someone whose mom needed an obscene amount of help was I was two hours and 15 minutes away and I had siblings who you could spit out the door and hit their house, but they were busy. Now, at that time, I was running three parishes in a school by myself. 
I was putting 40,000 miles a year on my truck doing hospital runs. I was out in the middle of nowhere, so nothing was close. And I started to wrestle right away with some real disappointment and anger, you know? Um, there was one point where I drove two out of half hours to get medication and get it to mom and then hustle back. And, and I text, you know, you do, you text like crazy, help, right? I'm very busy, I'm very busy. And I went in the drugstore to pick it up. And one of my sisters was right there. And I looked at her and went, this isn't good. That's all I could think to say, because a never fight one of my sisters, write that down. Right. Uh, but this was the first real struggle I ran into uh, was the idea. I don't have kids, right? Catholic priests are celibate. We don't marry. We don't have kids. And all my siblings have 8 million kids. Again, we are prolific. Yeah. Um, and they were like, well, you don't have kids. I'm like, well, I, I kind of do. I've got a school of 500 kids. I've got two parishes. There are three at that point. I didn't work didn't work. And I started to really get bitter at them. And at the same time, was kind of finding joy and helping mom because she was to the stage where she could communicate. Uh, and she said some crazy stuff. You know what I mean? Uh, now, she was always funny, but someone took the filter off. And uh, we were kind of having a riot. Uh, there was one point where dad called and he was like, please help right? The, everybody else is busy. So you, can you just come sit with her? And I got to get a shower. Uh, I'm like, yes, please do. Uh, you know, he wanted to get his hair cut. He wanted to shave. He wanted to get a shower. So I'm like, I'm in. So I drive there and it's a little wiggy. As you can imagine, I'm talking to 800 people on the phone the whole way, canceling this, moving that, right? Because there's, what is there? 78 million Catholics in this country and about 22,000 priests. Yeah. And you take that 22,000, 60% are over 70. So we are stretched as far as we can go. I mean, you can't tell, uh, still fat. Uh, thank you. So I'm driving there a little bit, you know, getting a little bit freaky, you know, talking to people. And of course people are mad. They say, take care of your mom, but they don't mean when it's going to influence bother them. Yeah. Father, we had an appointment. Yeah, see, that's why I'm calling. Uh, I knew we had one. Uh, we're going to move it. So anyway, I get to the house. I'm a little wigged out. I'm, I'm, I'm stressed out. I'm not, I'm irritated. So I get in and hug dad. And I'm like, yep, you need a shower. Uh, so he goes, yeah. And by the way, this huge, this house with all those kids, we have one shower right? Uh, which sweet, fancy Moses. Uh, thank God for school showers. Yeah. But um, he was gone a bit, right? I told him, take your time because the tigers were on. Mom loved the tigers. So we're sitting there watching the tigers and two interesting things that day. One is I found out my mom was in love with J.D. Martinez. Uh, he would, the camera, every time he stepped to the plate, it would hit his face. And this is honestly <sighs> should make like mom, you know, good Lord woman. Uh, and uh, two, my dad comes out and he's got, you know, clothes that are clean and he shaved. He got a haircut. He didn't smell like, you know, death. Uh, and my mom, when he walked in, honest to God, she went, Hey, <laughs> she says, who's that? I goes, mom, that guy's yours. And she just, you know, she felt pretty good about mom. Uh, but that, that, that was one of those things where I realized part of the survival process for me uh, was going to involve finding joy. Like when I was driving home, I was like, there's joy to be found. And it's hard to not cry now telling you how smart she was, how sharp she was, how amazing this woman was. And now she's four years old, right? But finding the joy. So when I got back, I wrote down rules for survival, right? How am I going to get through this? Uh, how will our family uh, cowboy up and love mom like she deserves? 
uh, how, how am I going to do this? And that is what I'm going to give you today uh, as best I can as a I'm a train wreck, right? Just like all of us are train wrecks here. If I talk to you about what I got down, all I would be able to tell you is how to spell my name. And on that 80% chance I'm right. Yeah. Uh, I can never speak to you from a place of perfection. Uh, I'll speak to you though, from what I learned. Uh, And I hope in this, you hear a few things. I hope you hear my ridiculous joy that you exist. I didn't know you existed until we needed you. Yeah. I didn't know people would help outside of our family. I found out about these, we knew about social workers because sometimes they'd bring kids over. Right. But I thought that's what they did. Right. They, they found kids in, in hell and brought them to mom and dad. I found out, no, they'll help us with mom. And sometimes the help was just acknowledging, yeah, this sucks. This is awful. Yes, thank you. Right? So I don't know you existed, but I, I needed you. And, and you were there. Or people, can I say that? Your tribe? You were there. And not because of financial gain based on the checks we wrote. Holy Lord, I'm a priest. I thought we got paid crappy, right? Yeah, so... First of all, and I I hope you don't mind this, I'm a philosophy and history teacher at heart. I got to tell you what I think a human is, so that this might make a little more sense at the beginning. I believe human is a body-soul unity. If you know your Socrates or your Plato, you've heard this. A human is a body-soul unity. And the, the bridge or the glue that connects the body and soul is our feelings. Okay, It's our emotions. That's the bridge from the soul to the body. That's what I think a human is. And if you're ever interested in an obscenely long and boring lecture on this, I'm your guy. <laughs> okay. So one of the things, uh, and, and John Paul II wrote about this uh, right after he was with the Beatles. Thank you. Who caught that? All right. Uh, he, he wrote, the, if, if, the, if our feelings are the glue between the body and soul, if they're the bridge between the body and soul, then the key to being a good human is to discipline and educate what you feel. Take every emotion to the classroom of your mind. Don't judge it, but educate it. So rule number one for me, I'm going to act like I wish I felt. Rule number one, I'm going to act like I wish I felt. Um, And... Is that counting down? Yeah, thank God. All right. I thought I already talked that long. I'm like, oh, sweet Lord, you poor people. Um, Yeah, see, this is why I shouldn't be in charge of a sandbox. Uh, Oh, there we were. So I'll act like I wish I felt. In any circumstance, you and I are fully capable of explaining how we feel. Um, But at the same time, some part of us has to get that our emotions are not really that reliable. Uh, So we don't judge them but I would take what I felt to the classroom of my mind and I would act instead like I wish I felt. When I told my nephew this, it was funny. He said, what about authenticity? I said, authentically, I'm a jerk. (laughs) Yeah. My nature is selfish. If it's not, there's something wrong with me. I'm not completely interested in authenticity. If authentic is, well, act like you feel. Because what is that but chaos? I can acknowledge how I feel and not judge it. Yeah, I could do that. And instead say, is this feeling going to help me or is it going to hurt me? If it's going to help me, plug in. If it's going to hurt me, pull the plug. Yeah, we grew up in the sticks. And back then, now, if anyone's my age or older, do you remember if you lived in the sticks, people would drop off dogs and cats? Yeah, this was before St. Bob uh, Barker, right? Spade and neuter your pets. And so people would get a dog. The dog would get pregnant, have puppies. We'd wake up and there'd be 10 puppies in our yard, right? And they were delicious. I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm kidding. They were not delicious. Uh, no, we would uh, we wake up and, and inevitably we had this one window right by our kitchen table. And I'd look and there'd be like 9,000 cats or dogs 
right? Just looking at these fat humans eat. Yeah. And I was always that kid, you know, Oh, it'd be a real shame if my plate fell off, you know, the table and onto the porch, you know, and my dad always said, if you feed them, they stay. So I fed them, but that wasn't as point as it turned out. Uh, and it's the same with our emotions that if we can acknowledge that emotion's not going to help me to do the thing I need to do, well, then I'm not going to feed it. It'll just get stronger. You know, we talk about venting with each other, right? Which is the Latin word for gossip. Uh, Has it ever made anything better? Or has it only strengthened our irritation with whatever caused us to vent? If it's about another person and about circumstance, then away. But when we complain about people, we'll get good at complaining about people. And we'll look for ways to that, for that to get reaffirmed. Yeah. So in the end, when I'd get out of the truck to walk in the house, and I'll be honest, I would cry the last hour trip. And I would cry the last the two hours going home. 15 minutes, I was awesome. You know. But when I walked in, hey, Pop. Yeah, I'm here. You know, uh, that's what I had to do. I didn't want to. I would have rather act like I felt. But he didn't need my feelings. He needed my commitment. He needed my love. And my love can't be a feeling or it'll fall apart week two. I was really challenged. I mean, I put it on a sticky on my dashboard. Act like you wish you felt. So that was my rule, number one. Act like I wish I felt with some measure of success. Yeah. Uh, Try to think of it like baseball. I'm I'm a big baseball guy, love baseball, and I'm a Tiger fan. I know suffering. Yeah. But, you know, if you get up to the plate in seven out of ten times, you fail. You're one of the best who's ever played the game. Think about that. If you get up and strike out or get out seven out of 10 times consistently, you're one of the best to ever hit. And in the same way, when we set the standard, when I set this standard for myself, I failed miserably sometimes. Sometimes I freaking crushed it. But I never gave up striving. I never gave up striving. I'm going to be the best human I can. Number two. And I loved that you had on there, uh, what is it? Counseling with compassion and joy. Yeah, because joy is a favorite word of mine. Uh, And why? Because it's not a feeling. The feeling is happy. Joy is a conviction. And it has nothing to do with our circumstances. In fact, the word happy, if you don't know this, if you know your Latin, comes from the Latin word hap, which means circumstance. It's where we get the word happen or happenstance, it comes from the Latin hap, meaning situation, circumstance. Namely, you win lottery, you're happy, yeah? And if you're not, you're doing it wrong, yeah? When our circumstances are easy or good, happy, yeah? Joy has nothing to do with that. Joy proceeds from a conviction. And I have a conviction that being a good human will make my life better. That honoring my mom is the right thing to do, no matter how hard it is. And that allowed me a foundation. And again, I lost it sometimes. Sometimes I wasn't joyful. I forgot my conviction and I focused on my circumstance. Um, Joy is a thing that you can grab now and hold on to for the rest of your life. Because, again, circumstances come and go. But what's inside of you that compels you? What are you ultimately striving for? That's the key that will keep you moving. You know, I worked with football at MSU for years. If they quit lifting when they got tired, they wouldn't get stronger. They aren't weightlifting and running and literally working till they puke because it makes them happy, they're doing it. They have this conviction, I need to be stronger. I need to be faster. I need to be better because this is important to me. 
You can tell it's not important to me. It used to be. That was funny. Have a conviction about you. Have a conviction and let that serve as a foundation that informs your actions and how you talk. If it's based on a feeling, you're going to struggle. Some days you'll be high as a kite, but most days you'll be sad because, and I don't know if you believe this and you don't need to, so I don't think I'm made for me. I don't. Um, one of my brothers, and I could say this about any job, right? There's a billion of us, but one of my brothers worked in the oil industry, right? He worked for Shell Oil. And when I went to see him, I was in eighth grade. And so dad's taking me to an oil refinery. And if, you know, if you're a farm kid, it's like, oh, you know, huge machines, lots of noise, tons of stank, you know, and you're walking around. It's like, this is like home. Thank you. Uh, what was the biggest part of the oil refinery? Do you know? Export. Right. You don't make enough oil, refine enough oil to keep the plant running. You're making it to export. And it's the same, I believe, for every human. We are made to be shared. I don't exist for me. If I exist for me, I become one of those people no one wants to be around. If I exist for others, then my life has a purpose beyond me. And I, and I believe that. All right. So this concludes part one of Father Drill Krupp. And uh, we'll come back next week to watch the second half.